to you in praise and adoration because, Lord, you alone are worthy. And as we come, gathering as the Ohana, as the family, Lord, it is with one heart, one mind, one spirit, we do just that. And asking, Lord, that by your spirit, Lord, you would touch our hearts, transform our lives from glory to glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's saints say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 4, shall we? John chapter 4, verse 43. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 43. Uh, Last time we were together, we finished up the section dealing with the woman at the well. We saw that this Samaritan woman had received living water from Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, she went back into Sychar, into the town, and told everybody about Jesus Christ. And they subsequently came out and met Jesus Christ. And they made an incredible proclamation. They said that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior of the world. And what a beautiful picture that is, how God chose to use this one woman who was less than upstanding to touch the heart of an entire city. And I'll tell you, that should bring all of us hope, amen? I mean, if God could use her, he certainly can use us to be sure. Well, the hearts of these people were so blessed and so transformed, they urged Jesus to stay with them. And he did, he stayed with them for two days. Now, according to verse 43 of John chapter 4, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Well, then Jesus said to, said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. (laughs) Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was that at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, back in John chapter 2 verse 11 The first sign that Jesus did was in Cana, changing water to wine. According to verse 54 of John chapter 4, the second sign that Jesus did was once again in Cana, where he there healed the nobleman's son. Now, in these final verses of John chapter 4, this section involves and revolves around faith. Faith in Jesus. And for you uh, note takers, you outliners, we've divided our text into two very simple sections. The first section involves lacking faith in Jesus in verses 43 through 45. Lacking faith in Jesus. The second section deals with having faith in Jesus. Now that's in verses 46 through 54. Well, let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It's only three verses dealing with the fact that there are those who lack faith in Jesus. And we would simply mention two things. Two things in this first section. 
The first thing that's involved in lacking faith in Jesus involves having no respect for Jesus. No respect for Jesus. Look at verses 33 and 30, or 43 and 44. It says, Now after the two days that he departed from there and went to Galilee. And now Jesus was in Sychar, the city of Samaria, in the central region of Israel. Back in verse 40, the people had urged him to stay, and he of course did. And two days later, he left the area of Judea, the region of the Judean wilderness, we might say, and traveled north up into Galilee. Now, he didn't go to the Sea of Galilee. He went to the area or the region of Galilee. In fact, according to verse 46, he came to Cana, which is in Galilee. And in verse 44, it says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, this word honor carries the idea of reverence or respect. And this statement is found in all four gospel accounts, that a prophet is not honored in his own country. Now, when it refers to his own country, that is a clear reference to where Jesus grew up, to the city of Nazareth, which is about five miles away from Cana. It speaks of those in his own town, his hometown. And I think the point is simple. Those in Jesus' hometown did not honor him because they did not have faith in him. They lacked faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, in Mark 6, 6, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. And I think for you and for me, the point is simple. When we lack faith in Jesus Christ, by default, we're not honoring him. We're not respecting him as it pertains to what he can do, as it pertains to who he is, as it pertains to the circumstances and situations in our lives. Because you know as well as I do, we all go through very difficult times in our lives. We all experience trials and tribulations. We all experience ups and downs, good times, hard times, difficulties. And if you've not yet experienced great trials and tribulation in your life, uh, cheer up. It won't be long until it happens to you like it's happened to the rest of us. So the question is, where are we going to put our faith? Because if we don't put our faith in Jesus Christ and his ability to orchestrate every aspect of our circumstances according to his perfect will, in effect, we're not honoring him. We're not respecting him as it pertains to who he is and what he can do. Number two, the second thing that's involved in lacking faith in Jesus involves the receiving of Jesus, the receiving of Jesus. Look at verse 45. It says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. You say, whoa, wait a minute, Clark. That doesn't sound like they were lacking faith in Jesus. It's, in fact, it sounds like they had faith in Jesus because they actually received Jesus. Well, the word received means to welcome, to greet, to be hospitable. And their welcoming of Jesus or their receiving of Jesus was based on the signs and wonders he did in Jerusalem. Uh, look at the rest of verse 45. It says, Having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, the feast of Passover, for they also had gone to the feast. So the only reason they welcomed Jesus or received Jesus is because of what they had seen Jesus do, what they saw him perform. Uh, turn back a couple of pages to John chapter 2, if you would, please. John chapter 2. Because the same thing happened to those who were in Jerusalem. 
They believed in Jesus based on what they saw. Uh, Take a look at verse 23. Let me show you what we mean. In John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But, but, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He knew that their faith in him was based on what they saw. It wasn't true saving faith. They didn't believe in him as Lord and as Savior. They simply believed in him as it pertains to the miracles he performed. Now, I think this becomes very important. Because there are those today who say, well, you know, Clark, if I can just see a sign, a wonder, a miracle, then I would really believe. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Miracles, signs, and wonders don't cause us to come to a true, saving faith in Jesus Christ. Back in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 14, we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man fared sumptuously every day, dressed in purple linen. And Lazarus was a a poor beggar who begged at his gate. And Lazarus died, and the rich man died. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and the rich man went to Hades, where he was tormented day and night. And the rich man, looking up into paradise, said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to me with his finger dipped in some water to touch my tongue, for I'm tormented with this fire day and night. And Father Abraham said, no can do. There's a great gulf between us that's fixed. You can't come to us and we won't come to you. And then the rich man said something very interesting. He said, well, Father Abraham, send Lazarus back into the world to tell my five brothers about this place so they don't come. Because if they saw somebody raised from the dead, then they would believe. Send Lazarus back. Now, I can just see Lazarus in the background going, no. (laughs) And by the way, if I die, please do not resuscitate me. Do not perform CPR. Do not inject me with anything that might bring me back to life. And if I find out you're the one that resuscitated me when I get back, we're going to have problems. Because I'm ready to be with Jesus. Once I go, I have no desire to come back. But then Abraham said something very interesting to the rich man there in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. He said, let them listen to Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Because even if one were to be risen from the dead, they would not believe. Wow. So a miracle isn't going to cause us to really have saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about what we can see. In fact, Jesus told Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe." And that's really what faith is all about, is it not? Faith isn't about what we see. In fact, sight is the antithesis of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence or the proof of things not seen. There's no wonder Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.7 that we walk by faith, not by sight. So truly, this whole idea of faith isn't about what we can see. It's about what we can't see. I can't see how my circumstances and situations are going to work themselves out tomorrow, next, next week, next year. I'm not sure how everything's going to be orchestrated in my life that I'm dealing with, that I'm struggling through. But by faith, I believe that God's on the throne. And by faith, I believe that he is going to work everything, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, according to the counsel of his will. And I guess the question for all of us is simple. Are we going to walk by faith or are we going to walk by sight? 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.18, we're not to look at the things that are seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but rather we should look at the things that are not seen. (laughs) For the things that are not seen are eternal. Back to John chapter 4. Let's come to the second and final section in our text today. The first section dealt with lacking faith in Jesus. Now the second section deals with having faith in Jesus in verses 46 through 54. Having faith in Jesus. And it of course deals with the story of a nobleman and his son. Now, having faith in Jesus is seen in the life of this nobleman in six ways. Six ways. The first way we see this nobleman having faith in Jesus is that he went to Jesus. Number one, he went to Jesus. That's in verses 46 and the beginning of verse 47. Take a look. In verse 46, it says, So Jesus came to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, or Capernaum, the village of Nahum, about 20 miles away. And when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea, there in the region of Samaria, into Galilee, he went to him. Now, this nobleman, the word nobleman, by the way, carries the idea of a royal official. It's a word that is used for one who works for the king or a governor, we might say. And chances are, this nobleman worked for Herod. That would be Herod the Tetrarch or ruler of the fourth part up in the region of the Galilee. Here is a guy who is very desperate. According to the end of verse 47, his son was at the point of death. He no doubt had exhausted all of his resources in trying to heal and help his son. He was out of options at this point. He had nothing left to do, nowhere else to turn. So he went to Jesus. And I think we see here a glimpse of his faith beginning to develop. I think here we see a picture of his faith in Jesus Christ. Now what is sad and what is unfortunate is that we oftentimes, like this nobleman, come to a place where we put our faith in ourselves, in our resources, in our abilities, in our strengths, in our efforts to try to work out the circumstances we're in. And when all fails, when we're out of options, then we go to Jesus. Well, you know, I've done everything I can possibly do. I guess it's time to pray. And unfortunately, our last resort should be our first resort. Because our resources are pathetic and limited compared to God's. God's resources are infinite, unlimited. And all that we would put our faith in Him. I think we should be wise. I think we should be prudent. Please don't misunderstand. I think we should use the brain that God's given us. I think we should be wise, faithful stewards. But at the same time, putting all of our faith in Jesus Christ, trusting that He is going to work everything out perfectly according to His plan and His will to be sure. So the first way we see Him having faith in Jesus involves the fact that He went to Jesus. Number two, I think the second way we see His faith is that He implored Jesus. He implored Jesus. Uh, Look at the end of verse 47. At the end of verse 47, it says, And implored him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. This word implored means to ask, to beseech, to request. But it's in what we call the imperfect tense. In other words, he kept on 
asking. He kept on beseeching. He continually was requesting. In fact, drop down to verse 49 for just a moment. Look at verse 49. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Here we see this guy didn't give up. He kept on asking Jesus to heal his son. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't quit. He kept the faith. And I think this is an important point. Because there are those today who say, well, you know, if you pray for something more than once, you really lack faith. Oh, really? I think just the opposite is true. I think if you don't pray for something more than once, you lack faith. (laughs) Because by praying for something more than once, by asking, requesting, beseeching God, regarding our circumstance over and over and over again, means that we are putting our faith in Him to answer our prayer. If we just threw up one prayer and left it at that, I mean, I'm not so sure that's faith. Because we just give up, we throw in the towel. When we keep on keeping on, we might say, I think it is really a demonstration of the faith we have in God to answer our prayers. I think we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul was caught up into the third heaven? He saw things that were inexpressible, unlawful for him to even talk about. And God gave him a thorn in the flesh. What it was, we're not sure. Some think it was an eye problem. We don't know. But whatever it was, Paul prayed that God would heal him. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, the Bible says that he prayed three times that God would heal him. The same prayer, three times. Did Paul lack faith? Absolutely not. It was a demonstration of his faith. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew chapter 26, the Bible says in Matthew 26, 44, that he prayed the same prayer three times. Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. He prayed three times the exact same prayer. Did Jesus lack faith? Absolutely not. No question about it. So I think the fact that this guy kept on asking, kept on beseeching, really is a demonstration of his faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, that we too wouldn't give up. That we wouldn't throw in the towel. Thinking that, well, you know, I guess God's not going to, you know, he's not able to make this happen. What? Are you kidding me? No, our faith is in him and his ability to orchestrate everything according to his perfect will. Number three. Let's come to a third way we see having faith in Jesus' exercise. Number one, he went to Jesus. Uh, Number two, he implored Jesus. And now number three, he believed in Jesus. He believed in Jesus. Uh, That's in verses 48 through the beginning of verse 50. Take a look. In verse 48, Jesus said to him, this nobleman, unless you, and notice the word people is in italics, it's not in the text, Uh, the pronoun you is plural, therefore uh, it's listed as you people, unless you all see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now, Jesus here brings up signs and wonders. He's saying, look, unless all you guys see signs and wonders, you're not really going to believe. You're not going to have true saving faith. Now, Jesus here is not discounting signs and wonders. Please don't misunderstand. Signs and wonders were very important in the New Testament. Uh, According to Mark chapter 16, verse 20, signs and wonders were used to confirm the preaching of the apostles. It's what validated their ministry. But the problem is believing in Jesus Christ based on signs and wonders isn't true saving faith. Because signs and wonders can be counterfeited. They can be duplicated. You know, in, Acts, uh, in um, Exodus chapter 7, 
when Moses and Aaron were performing the, the plagues in Egypt, the ten plagues that God was bringing upon the Egyptians, the Bible says that Pharaoh's magicians, who in the New Testament presumably are uh, Janus and Jambres, they duplicated the miracles, the signs and wonders that Moses performed. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, we're told that Satan performs lying signs and wonders. So signs and wonders are not the basis for true saving faith. In fact, look at verse 49 and 50. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. Now think about that. He didn't believe the signs and wonders. He believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. Therefore, seeing is not believing. Faith does not come by seeing. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This fella heard the word of God himself that your son is healed and therefore he believed. And that is one reason, listen, why we place such great importance on the teaching of God's word. Why do we come together every Sunday, every Wednesday, Monday for the men's study, Thursday, gals, you're starting up for the women's study in the book of Daniel, by the way, if you haven't signed up, gals, uh, for the women's Thursday Bible study, be sure to do that. They're feverishly printing out all of your Daniel booklets uh, this last week. It was pretty crazy, but they're coming together and you gals are going to be blessed. Why do we come together to study the Word of God? Because it's God's Word that begins to grow and mature our faith. Not signs, not wonders, not miraculous occurrences. True saving faith is based on the Word of God because that's where the power is. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, please don't misunderstand. We do believe that miracles are for today, that signs and wonders do happen. But signs and wonders do not bring us into a place of true saving faith. It is through hearing, not seeing. Back to John chapter 4. Let's come to a fourth matter. The fourth thing involves obedience to Jesus. Obedience to to Jesus. At the end of verse 50, and I love this, it says, and he went his way. At the beginning of verse 50, Jesus said, go your way. At the end of verse 50, he went his way. This speaks of obedience to Jesus. Jesus told him to go. And he did. Why? Because he believed. By faith, he believed that Jesus Christ did not need to make that 20-mile journey back to Capernaum from Cana to heal his son. He believed that Jesus can do it even 20 miles away. And that speaks of his faith being seen in his actions. We might say he put feet to his faith. And I think this is an important point. Uh, turn back to James chapter 2 for a moment, if you would, please. James chapter 2. Because it is one thing for us to say we have faith. We can say we have faith all day long. We can say we truly believe. But you know, those are just words coming out of our mouth. How do we know we truly have faith. How can we be sure we really believe? Well, it's based on what we do. It's based on the actions we have. Take a look at verse 14 of James chapter 2, because James talks about this quite a bit. In James 2.14, he says, 
But what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? No, because he doesn't have true saving faith. Because his faith is seen by his works. In verse 15, he gives this illustration. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and uh, one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? It, well, it profits nothing. Thus also faith, here's the parallel, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's not true saving faith, it's a dead faith. We're simply mouthing a few words. But if we have true saving faith, it's going to be realized in our actions. But, verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. Well, that's impossible. And I will show you my faith by my works, by what I do, by how I live my life. I have absolute faith. Listen, I have absolute faith in Jesus Christ regarding the circumstance I'm in. Therefore, I'm not freaking out about it. I'm not fretting over it. I'm understanding that God's on the throne. And he's going to take care of it according to his plan and his purpose. Therefore, my actions are really the proof of my faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Hey, you have faith there is God, right on. But even the demons have that. They believe and tremble. So it's not about faith alone. The demons have faith, they believe in God. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect or complete? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God. He had faith in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called a friend of God. No, Abraham wasn't saved by good works. His good works are the proof that he was saved. (laughs) Because he was made righteous because he believed, clearly in verse 23. How do we know he had true saving faith? Because of what he did. He was obedient to God to offer up Isaac, his son, his only son, whom he loved. You see, that's true saving faith. And that is manifested in our obedience to the Lord. Back to John chapter 4. Let's come to a fifth matter. We have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. Number five. The fifth thing involves peace from Jesus. Number five. Peace from Jesus. Look at verses 51 through the beginning of verse 53. In verse 51 it says, And as he was now going down, he was leaving Cana, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, or one o'clock in the afternoon, according to Jewish time. The fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed. Now, You say, Clark, I thought you said this dealt with peace from Jesus. Yes, it does. How do we see peace in the life of this nobleman? Well, note carefully, class, that this nobleman spent the night in Cana. Did you catch that? He spent the night in Cana. According to verse 50, Jesus said, Go your way, your son lives. And apparently, he had such faith In Jesus' ability to heal his son, he spent the night. Because according to verse 52, the servants told him, your son got better yesterday. Wow. In other words, he was in no rush to get home. Here his son, according to the end of verse 47, is at the point of death, and Jesus said he's not going to die, and this nobleman said, okay, right on. I think I'll just spend the night here and take it easy. I'm in no rush to get home. 
because I have faith in Jesus' ability to heal my son. And that brought great peace to his heart. So much so, he spent the night in Cana. You know, as I thought about that for a moment, I couldn't help but think of the great peace that we often miss out on because of our lack of faith in Jesus Christ. But what great peace is available to each and every one of us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ? Now this man's great peace, listen carefully, was not based on his great faith. Because it's not about the quantity of our faith. It's not about the size of our faith. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, if we had faith only the size of a mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds. So it's not about the quantity of our faith. It's about the object in which we place our faith. Because our faith is only as great as the object in which we place it. And there's no greater object we can put our faith in than Jesus Christ. There's no greater object we can put our faith in. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, now even though our faith is small as a mustard seed, we have great faith because it's not about the volume of our faith. It's not about the quantity of our faith. It's about where we're putting our faith. This is a huge issue. And here this man had great faith peace, so much so he spent the night in Cana. What great rest. What great peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. I think we should just all close our eyes and take a little nap at this point. <laughs> you say, Clark, that's what I've been doing for the first half of the service. <laughs> <laughs> but because of our faith in Christ, not because I'm boring you to death. You see, there's a difference. <laughs> Amen, okay. <laughs> Number six. The sixth and final thing is that he told others about Jesus. Number six. He told others about Jesus. According to the end of verse 53, it said not only he believed and his whole household. Question. How did his whole household believe? Well, no doubt he told them. I mean, they were excited. This young son of his was healed. And he comes back the next day. And they're no doubt rejoicing, clamoring, thanking for this healing. And then this man comes back and no doubt tells them exactly how he was healed. And his whole household believed. He was telling others about his faith in Jesus, just like the woman at the well. And I guess the question for all of us is simple. What are we putting our faith in? Are we putting our faith in ourselves, in our own resources, our own abilities? Are we putting our faith in Jesus Christ? And as we put our faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life, it is equally important to put our faith in Jesus Christ for temporal life. I mean, look, if you were to die today, God forbid, don't you have absolute faith that if you were to die today, you'd be in heaven with Jesus? Okay, about five of you, good. Well, why not have that same faith in the same Jesus for what's sitting on your desk tomorrow morning for what you have to deal with this week for the marriage relationship for the family issues 
for the financial woes. I mean, look, whatever we're going through, whatever we're dealing with, man, putting our faith in Jesus Christ for every moment of every day of our lives. Father, how thankful we are for your word, so rich, so powerful, so practical. Lord, that it (laughs) continues to bolster our faith in you. And Lord, we do believe. (laughs) But Lord, help us with our unbelief. (laughs) Help us with our lack of faith. As we look to you, because Lord, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. So Lord, we just pray that by your spirit, you would continue to grow us and mature us. Continue to lead, guide, and direct us as we walk by faith, not by sight. In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you are here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, after service the pastors and brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, just to minister to whatever need you may have in your life today. And how I pray that God's Spirit would continually be poured out upon you as you go forth from here by faith, realizing that God's on the throne and He's going to work everything according to the counsel of His will, having faith in what He's going to do and how he's going to do it. That you would experience great peace, great rest, great tranquility of spirit. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a a great week in the Lord.